you giving, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit how are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about cultivating leaders. That's the key. Right now, especially today, we need good leaders and corrections. But guys, it really does start out at the beginning of that career. I mean, we're, are we cultivating good leaders? Are we showing support for the people that could potentially be our leaders? And I think what we're going to discuss today with Connie, Connie's also going to be on the show, is you know, what makes a good leader and then what we could do to support people that are trying to move up and become that good leader. Now, let me introduce an author or will be an author by a published author by October 30th, Connie Eileen, drum roll, please. Oh no, drum roll, Melody. sorry. Drum roll, please. <laughs> da, 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 da. Connie Eileen, what's up, Connie? How you doing? Hi, 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 everybody. Connie Eileen here. I am the founder and president of the Civilian Corrections Academy. I'm also the podcast host for The Fly Behind the Wall, and now published author will be added to the list, which I'm so excited about. The Cage Was Her Cocoon is released. Pre-release sales are October 15th, and official sales from the website begin on October 30th. Guys, I had a chance to read through this book, guys. It hits home. If you're in the profession, please check it out. Even if you're not in the profession, you're just looking to hear a story that you can relate to, a story that has struggle but also hope. You know, um, I, I guess the story that actually, just like what Frederick Douglass says, without struggle, there's no progress. That's the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, you kind of take us into that, how a butterfly becomes a butterfly. And I, I really enjoyed the book, obviously. And also I have a book, uh, it's in the editor's office right now. If you guys are looking to add a story to it, we have about a week left. Please guys, send it, email it to me, gangeanthony at yahoo.com. That's gangeanthony at yahoo.com. But I want a story about the process of manipulation. If it happened to you, let's hear it so we can protect other people uh, from going through the same concerns that you could have faced. And uh, I'm really excited. Again, I think it'll be a great manual. And uh, thank you, Connie, for motivating me to really push forward and also give me the connections to actually have it at an editor as we speak. Now, guys, this is a very important topic. Uh, this is actually Connie's idea. Uh, we actually touched on it a little bit for the Guardian RFID. We're going to explore it a little bit more here. And uh, I think right now it's going to hit home. I, I really do. I think we need good leaders right now because we're going through tough times and good leaders will be a way, uh, are the people that actually help us with that employee morale to keep people motivated, to keep people wanting to be in this great profession. Um, so I think it's a, definitely a needed topic. Now, guys, if you haven't, the show Tear Talks for you, brave men and women that work in corrections. So please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor and we come back cultivating leaders stand by i wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program i wanted to look at problems different i wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities amu offered those avenues to expand obtaining your degree as an adult you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself you can't put a dollar on it it's priceless it's something that can never be taken away from you american military university learn from the leader. Now guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is gonna save your career. It's gonna save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt, and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now, link in description. And we are back. So, Connie, we actually touched up on this when we were doing it for Guardian RFID. And again, we never know where we're going to go. So right now, we kind of have an idea because we touched on it before. But I think we can explore it a little bit more because we have a little bit more time to do that. But right now, if we had to talk about what makes a good leader, 
because we have to define that first before we go into that. And your opinion on the medical side, because I'm sure whatever makes a good leader on the medical side could also be the same thing for custody side or the civilian side as well. What makes a good leader in your opinion? So in my opinion, I think a good leader is someone who has the vision to kind of see where this organization is going forward. So if in the medical world, we're in the facilities, we can see the potential of what's coming in. Many of us, I know, prior to MAT officially coming in, were already having conversations because MAT was happening in the, you know, in the community. So I think having vision is one thing. I think there's a level of transparency and honesty that has to be in place as it relates to being a leader. You have to be able to allow people in to kind of know your story and be vulnerable to an extent because, you know, they have to be able to relate to you. And I think certainly having a knowledge base, right? You want your team to be confident that you know what you're doing and that they're following someone who's worthy of them following them, right? Not just following for the sake of the title. And I think, you know, you want to make sure that the leader is someone who is going to be willing to take or hold themselves accountable for their team. So something goes awry, the leader isn't just ducking out the way and looking to, you know, point the finger. Yes, they're absolutely going to hold their people accountable. But when, you know, the crap rolls down the hill, you want to know that your, your leader has your back. Yeah. And also, I think for me, what motivated me to become a leader was I... I was always willing to take responsibility of someone else's choices. I know right off the bat, that's number one. Don't come into a supervisory position or that leadership position if you're not willing to do that, to take that level of responsibility over others. So right off the bat, I wasn't looking at the money first. I wasn't looking at, you know, whatever, you know, that power of authority that you have because, because at the end is now I have more responsibility and I'm willing to take that responsibility on. So I think you touched on just pretty much everything. That makes a good leader, you know, being constructive, uh, doing your best to get that mission, you know, to mm -hmm. make sure that we're all working together. Um, good communication skills. Uh, someone who has the experience of what needs to be done and knows how to delegate that, but also doesn't micromanage. They empower. Mm -hmm. They don't make people hesitant. And I think nowadays when we have higher level that's looking to write up all the time, uh, that can also put a lot of pressure on management to where they're afraid to make the mistakes or afraid to let their employees learn because at the end, they're also going to get torn apart. So I, I think there has to be some level of, again, if it's not emergent, some level of forgiveness in the regards of we have to teach, we have to be constructive. We, you know, we have to allow to some level mistakes are going to happen and we have to kind of look at the mistakes that are you know mistakes made but the purpose was good it's just the person made a mistake and really separate that from people who aren't you know who are just really just negligent or you know worst comes to worst if they're committing criminal acts and that's not really a mistake but people that have good intent and make a mistake should not be held in the same light as people that aren't doing their job and just don't give a shit uh, excuse my language but now when it comes to cultivating, when it comes to making sure you provide an environment that um, shows support, because that's the key. Um, I think here, one thing is for any department, you want to make sure that when you provide opportunities of growth, that if you can, that they're plentiful. The, the reason why I'm saying that is because when we tend to have limited resources or only that one position that comes up only once every two years, people, it's limited resources. You, you wind up having a competitive environment where people are looking to be better than the next and really people aren't supporting each other's growth. So I think one thing is, is to have a good amount of um, opportunity, even if it's not just trajectory, you know, straight up the path, maybe there's stuff to the left and right. I think in my agency, we offer a lot. If you can't make sergeant, you could also go this route, this route, and this route. This way, we truly are good with each other because we're not competing for the same position. You know, hey, I'm glad you became sergeant. Hey, guess what? I just became an investigator for the Internal Affairs Division. Oh, that's great. So we truly are working together. But what's your thoughts on that about increased opportunity can help us be more supportive with each other? 
So absolutely, I think when the pool is bigger, then you have more people who can go swimming in the pool, right? Like, you know, when we do have more opportunities, those are different ways that we could support growth because it, it's not just one opportunity, right? It's not just one position. It's multiple people with different skill sets that we can help to guide them through that process to actually achieve that. And I think when people feel supported and people feel as though, you know, they do have people kind of cheering them on and they want to see them succeed, that that can make all the difference. You know, people start doing things for the right reasons. It's like we are in this space where we're reinforcing the positive behavior that we want to see. And that is people working hard, people seeing that there's opportunities in their future and people being willing to do the work to get there. And I think when we create a space where people can be vulnerable and they can say, I need help, or I don't understand this, or can you explain this to me? I think that's when we really start to see the growth. We start to see the growth in our teams because now it shows us that they're critically thinking and they're trying to figure things out. And I think when we give them a little leeway as well, we give them the ability to take the initiative to really be empowered to make a change, to do something different. We're not saying go against, you know, the policies, the procedures and get us all jammed up. What we're saying is that there's ways for us to do things more effectively and still be in line with, you know, policy and procedure. Yeah. And I think obviously at the beginning of your career, you're very vulnerable. And I think how you're approached when you make a mistake uh, could give you the confidence or, unfortunately, uh, could make you hesitant. So I think as a, as a leader, because uh, I think we're talking about a leader's perspective first before we get to the peers, be constructive. You know, so when you go to approach that employee, like you're saying, Connie, is if they make a mistake, again, look at the mistake first, negligent or good intent, but just went bad, and then be constructive. Take the time and whatever you do as you're talking to them, somehow motivate the growth. Be careful with those dialogues at the very beginning, I'm telling you, you could have people that could come in with the best intent and probably could really have a great impact on this profession, mm -hmm. but they could make a mistake. And then how you approach them could totally affect how they're gonna be the rest of their career. Because again, it's not like it's a veteran officer going through that. This is someone who's still trying to have an impression. Mm -hmm. And you know, you wanna, when, when, when you're trying to have that impression at the very beginning of the profession, you wanna make sure we do what we can to push them into a positive way. and. Be very careful of the words you say that, again, that you, you may be able to say to a senior staff, but you're not going to be able to say that that person who hasn't identified themselves in this profession, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you just got to know when people first come in, they're putting their best foot forward. They're doing their best to not make a mistake, to not get jammed up, to not, you know, look bad in the eyes of those more senior folks who are kind of waiting to see which way this person is going to be. Are they going to survive this, right? Because this job is not for the faint at heart, right? So ultimately, if in that first instance that you make a mistake, you get reamed out. I mean, maybe it's justifiable ream out, I don't know. But I think as managers, we have to have enough emotional intelligence to be able to know what's the right way to approach this person so that they don't lose their motivation. I mean, we talked about it before. Sometimes someone can come down on you and you start seeing that light start to dim that person came in so excited, so, you know, willing, so just wanting to do everything. And sometimes, sometimes, yeah, there's some misplaced confidence, but I think when you come in and you've got people who may come at you in a negative way, because you've made a mistake, it may certainly dissuade you from wanting to continue to stay in the profession or even to continue putting that best foot forward, you know, instead of becoming, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can, you become, I'm going to do what I need to do just to get through the day. Yeah. And I, and I wow. Uh, that's hundred percent. Correct. Uh, I, I actually, in my profession, I could see that change in people from what you just said to I'm going, I'm going to do what I got to do to learn. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know what, I'm just going to get through the day and I'm going to tell you something that's not something you want at the very beginning of your career. I mean, I'm kind of feeling that now I have 18 years in, but I've been through this before. I'll get through it again. Uh, you know, but you don't want to feel that at the beginning when you're already, you're just learning right now. You know, I mean, I, I don't want, you don't want to burn out your rookies within the first couple of weeks of them being on the job, you know, a couple of years even. Um, 
But another thing also is that I think as a leader, and again, we're just talking about what they can do as well uh, real quick, is that they also have to encourage the environment by making sure that the person is supported. So I, I've seen where you have individuals that decide to go back to school, you know, mm -hmm. may want to go to college because they want to, this is a career for them and they want to, you know, increase their opportunities in getting it, you know? I mean, sometimes you work in these, when, when you start going for these higher level positions, Sometimes the positions, they kind of know who they already want, sad to say, but it's true. But you don't want to make it easy for them to decide that. You know, you want to be able to present something. I mean, for me, when I went into the position I'm in now, it's an appointed position. I went back to college, did everything that that thing had asked for. And then even when I was interviewed, I said the, thing, the steps I've taken in my career is because you guys wanted me to take it. These are the steps that you want. So if you want to look at initiative and drive, it's right there. These aren't just, you know, I made it tangible for you. You know, some people say I have drive, I have persistence. Prove it. I just did. Whatever you wanted, I did. I, I put pressure back on the agency that if you really support growth and you really want this, then these are the things that people should have done that I've done, you know? And I, and I did get selected on my first interview. You know, and again, I was motivated, but I got lucky. I worked on a shift where they really did support me uh, going back to school. I, I, I've been blessed. I, I'm not, I, I have no reason to badmouth the people I worked with my whole career. Uh, they were always very supportive because I was also supportive of them. And I think one of the things also here, guys, and what people don't realize, and I think Connie could definitely touch on this, is that the last thing we want is we want people to remember who they are. We want them to take the roots of them with them as they go up. We don't want them to cut the roots each time they move up. Like, you know what? I'm moving up because I can't be with these people on the front line anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and take the next level up. And then all of a sudden it's like, I'm going to take next. They're not holding on to the roots because there's no reason for them to, because they, they just had this people that just never supported them. And then when they make it to the top, you have people like, wow, I can't believe this person totally forgot where they came from. I mean, all right, but let me ask you a question. And again, this is not for everybody, just, you know, in general, but have we given them a reason to remember the roots? I mean, for me, I've had great roots. So I've always remembered the roots because I, I miss it. I, 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 you know, I, I miss it. But I, for me, it's hard for me to forget the roots because it's, it's, it's something that was important to me as I moved up. So I, I think, and Connie, we touched on this before, but, you know, if we want people to kind of remember who they are as they move up or remember where they came from, we play a big part in that, correct? Absolutely. I mean, because people remember who's the person who gave me help when I needed it. Who's the person who guided me in the right direction. Even if they couldn't personally help me, they put me in connection with someone who could help me get from point A to point B. Who, got, who helped get me out of a jam? Who helped me see something different that I didn't see when that incident took place, right? Who helped me? Because I remember, like, there were folks who... It was my first incident report. I was like, what am I supposed to write? I don't even, like, I mean, you know, I think what we may take for granted. So with custody, you guys have a certain level of training. You know, you're identifying, you're observing, you're taking these mental notes of things. And as civilians, you know, we're kind of like in the, in, the, in the midst of providing our service, then something pops off and we're like, oh, what happened, right? And sometimes I think in not having that awareness, we miss out a lot of details. And so... I remember when I was told, I, I was like, like, honey, you need to write an incident report. I'm like, I don't know how. And so I remember an officer, like he literally walked over and was like, all right, just, I know you're nervous. Cause like it, it was a whole big fight, which, you know, like I never was involved in that. So he was like, all right, I know you're nervous. Here's what you need to do. What you can do on a scrap paper, write down what you remember you saw. Right. And then you can make it make sense. Like, but not while your, your nerves are <laughs> in an uproar, right? And to me, I will never forget that officer. That was Officer Brown. He kind of just took me to the side and was like, hey, listen, pull yourself together. <laughs> and sometimes you need that, right? And through my career, he's like, oh, look at you. Like, and then when I got a promotion, he was like, oh, look, you know, and he would celebrate just remembering, like, I remember when she first got here and we had that incident and, and it, he never talked to anyone else about it. It was never like something he made fun of. So feeling that level of support, as well as just someone who was concerned for not just like my well-being, but like my ability to accomplish the mission, right? The mission was get that incident report done. And while you work through your nerves, here's a way for you to do it. 
you remember those people on your journey. You remember those people who encouraged you. And so, yes, you will always remember where you came from because those are the things that were actually pleasant memories. But you also remember the person who told you you wasn't shit or like you didn't know what you was doing and and the person who kind of stomped on your self-esteem and and broke your confidence and who didn't encourage you when you probably needed it the most. Right, I want to actually comment on that real quick. There's something important that you said when that, that really deals with motivation. But I also got to say just a little bit about the growth of Care Talk. Uh, about maybe a month and a half, two months ago, Connie did an impersonation of an officer, which was just pretty much a deeper voice and a few F-bombs. Uh, now, I, I know you remember it. I just have to say, guys, look how much she has grown. Officer Brown did not curse. Had a very light and pleasant voice. I I I, I thought it was pleasant, and uh, just <laughs> if you guys just go back about a month and a half, that's a totally different per person. But she knows what I'm getting at. I'm oh, sorry, man. I had to do it. You know, you know, I was gonna get to oh, that. <laughs> and when you said something so key, that I want to ask you something. I think it's worth exploring. Okay, so you're right. You know what? You have those that I think can push you right into the right direction. That's a great way to be motivated to grow, right? People are pushing me. They have these expectations of me. Wow, I really want to do it. There are some people that when you have people come and say, you ain't shit, you're never going to be nothing, they motivate themselves, but that's a, it's an isolated motivation, if, if I may. It's like, okay, well, all you're doing is pushing me away from you know this, from where I should always try my best to remain connected. So for anybody who feels, I'm, I'll, I'll throw this over to you, Connie, because you kind of opened up the door to this, was, for anybody that uses that, like, I ain't shit, or, you know, for someone to say, hey, you ain't shit, blah, 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 as a motivation to move up, because there'll be people that do that. Do you think that's the right motivation? It absolutely is not the right motivation. I mean, so you have different personalities, and some people who may take that and like, yeah, let me show you how much I'm not shit, right? And they may do their best to just prove you wrong. But then you have some people who will take that and, like, really internalize that. And it becomes that thing, that, that, that old conversation that they keep working from. I remember this person telling me, I'm not shit, that they're never confident in their decisions. They're always kind of second guessing themselves. And it really stagnates them because they don't really know where to go from there until hopefully they do come across someone who then gives them something positive. I mean, and certainly we're not saying that people are going to hold on to these statements, but sometimes when you internalize those negative statements, it's very difficult for you to kind of dig yourself out of that. Yeah, and I thought that was great. I don't think that's something we ever really explored. That could be a whole topic in itself. Um, and then just to briefly, because I don't want to go to the peers real quick, I want to try to keep this episode short. Um, we always talk about empowerment and transformational leadership. So you're, you as a leader should be able to teach people to be future leaders. That's the key, you know, empower mm -hmm. them. Uh, if you micromanage them, they lose that level of empowerment. They wind up becoming hesitant. And even if they become supervisors, eh, they're not going to take initiatives. You know, that's the problem because they're going to be hesitant. And again, be careful, you know, if you're always quick to go to paper and pen. And, and if, you, if you have to, because sometimes it hap happens, listen to the story. Was this negligence or, you know, did this person really have good intent? That's the key. Now, real quick, again, I, I want to kind of explore the peers a little bit more because I know we kind of crossed into it, but I think there's a little more here that – we can discuss. Um, for me, uh, when I got into uh, corrections and I started to move, or I had the urge to start moving up, there were some uh, that didn't think I would make it in a male facility. Again, I started my career at a female facility. And yes, part of me definitely wanting to get that position was to prove them wrong. That was part. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm human, you know, and as I said, we, I've learned a lot by doing this show as well. So, I mean, um, but also that it wasn't the sole reason like, you know, it came to me at one point where someone had asked me, are you willing to take responsibility for other people's work? And that's when I really thought about it. And then I've become that person to do that. Uh, I, I don't mind. This is my department. This is what I'm responsible for. Let's, let's either be successful together or if we fail, let's mm -hmm. do it together. And then we'll figure out what we got to do from there. Cause it happens. No, no one's mm -hmm. perfect, but let's talk about support, you know, from a peer level. Uh, what, what type of support are we looking for? What type of support from the peers do cultivate growth from, let's say, maybe that, for me, it's right from the get-go. If I have a rookie coming in 
and they have that drive, I actually want to see how far I can, we as a team can keep that drive going to keep it cultivated. I think that if we work with a lot of disgruntled employees or if you're a disgruntled FTO, you're killing us because these could be the potentials to be future admin and all these other positions. But the problem is, is that we're pushing the person away. So I like what you said real quick too, real quick, misplaced confidence. Uh, that was very well said because the thing is, when I talk about a rookie having a drive, I'm not talking about a rookie that's full of ego that already on the first day thinks they can run a prison. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about someone to drive, to learn, to be that apprentice, to follow the right route and to really uh, listen to their, you know, their peers and do whatever they can to grow from, you know, not being resistant to what's around them. That's willing to help uh, influence that growth. Mm -hmm. But what would you think peers could do to cultivate a young leader or the potential for someone to be a young leader? So I think first understanding is crucial. I think when you can show that rookie that you understand what they're going through because you walked in their shoes, not coming at them from that space of I know it all, but from, okay, so this is where you are now. I understand why you made that decision, but here's what you also need to consider because it's identifying or being able to identify with where that rookie is at that point in their career right? And knowing that and allowing that person to know, like, you're not alone. You're not the only one that this happened to, you know, like, I think we've all made novice mistakes. And I think the reality is that when you kind of get from your colleagues or from your peers that, listen, take it easy. It's not that serious. This is what I had the same experience or similar experience. So the understanding, I think being relatable and then being able to share your experiences and help that person grow as opposed to making them seem like, you know, you lost your keys, right? You lose your keys and you're causing a lockdown. That's, that's something different, right? But you made a mistake, right? And, you know, we can help you through that process. You know, I think when, as a, as a, one of my peers, I would want my peers to kind of show me the way. Like, okay, so I might have messed up here, but what do I need to do in order to get it right? And just my peer having that kind of interest in my success in of itself is a great feeling to have. Like, okay, now I got somebody I could kind of vibe with and they're going to help me get to the next step or they're going to help me not do this again. Right. And like, I think like, that's just what you need. It's that support from your colleagues. It's not the judgment. It's not the blame game. Oh yeah, look what you did. And, you know, cause sometimes there's some really bad feelings that come a along with you made a mistake. And there are some people who are going to look down on you and may make some really crappy comments. But I think at the end of the day, when you got somebody who's willing to say, listen, I've done that, been there, done that. Don't worry about it. Here's how we fix it. Here's how, this is what we do moving forward. You know, I think that's what really matters. And for the people that, score, by the way, I agree. Uh, by the, the people that score well on the test, uh, be humble. Um, yeah, got to be humble because all because you score, scored well on the test doesn't mean that you're smarter than the person who didn't. Uh, because I know there could be a lot of people that get disgruntled because they just can't pass the test. I mean, some people just are not good test takers. But then when you work with the guy, it blows your mind, or the female, I'm sorry, it blows your mind because you know that person knows their job. But just sometimes people just are not good test takers. So even though you're able to pass the test and even though you're able to move up, be humble. You still don't know everything. And give that respect back because even if you have people that – they're not passing the test and they too want to be supervisors. Hopefully they see that when you give that level of respect back to them, they're not in conflict with you becoming one because they can't become one. I mean, that's the key. And, and, and Connie, let me ask you this, because this, this I think is a, a very unique question for you uh, that I think you can help me out with too. So if I'm in conflict because I can't become a supervisor, I'm trying and I can't, what can I do to open up myself to accepting this person as becoming a supervisor you're laughing because that that's not that's not is that a hard it's a hard question right it, it is. is i mean because that, that means that means you have to have enough insight into yourself to know that because it's not the other person's fault 
that you haven't been able to get to where you need to be. And so they come in, perhaps if you are insightful enough, maybe I could learn something from that person that's going to get me to where I want to go. Right. I know it's probably tougher to take that approach. It's almost, you know, you're going to take the high road on it because you might feel bitter. You know, you might feel a little salty about that. But the reality is that it's not that person's fault, you know, and it may not even be your fault. You might not be a good test taker. Right. And so is there some way for you to get around that? I'm not saying like not take the test. What I'm saying is if there's some accommodation that could be made to assist you in that test taking process you know maybe that's something you need to explore I don't know of there being a way so I don't even want to go there there might be I don't know but I also feel like if in fact that person comes in who has the job that you wanted to have you know take your time to get to know the person and see what that person has to offer that may help you to get to where you need to be yeah, I, I don't want people's, and I think that's great, Connie. I don't want people's want to be in that position to overpower their ability to accept other people in that position. I, I think I'm saying it correct. I'm, I'm trying to say it as mm -hmm. I go. But, you know, I, I don't want the fact that oh, all because you couldn't get the position for you now to hate me because I got the position. Because, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, at the end of the day, when we're, going, when we're doing those tests, you know, we are, you know, we're motivated. We're doing it to move ourselves up. But, but it's not that we're doing it so I could step on the person that can't do it. It's just at that point, you know, don't, don't take it personal. I, I moved into this position. But because I have a feeling sometimes what people don't realize is that's another reason why we cut people off. We get so mad that they become supervisors and we couldn't, you know. But, but with that said, that doesn't mean that you still can't have that impact on that individual who made it into that position. I know a lot of supervisors that will be quickly, quickly humble themselves up to anybody with experience. I'm talking about high level majors that will humble them, especially if they made it quick in their career, because it could happen, who will humble themselves up to a 24, 25 year veteran. At that point, it's not about the rank, you know, I mean, unless, unless, the, listen, I, I always say this, don't put me in a position where I have to make my rank or my position known. We don't have to do that. You know, I don't have to always walk on a tier and advertise that I'm a major or I'm a superintendent. It, there's no need for that. That only needs to come out when there's a problem with something that has to be done, you know. But at the most part, you know, when you have that dialogue, that, that, that position should automatically be respected without you having to advertise. I mean, it's just staff now. This isn't inmates. This is staff. So I, I don't see what's wrong with, let's say, uh, you, uh, you know, a major, you know, going up to a senior staff and having that dialogue, that one-on-one, -on -one, and the major being willing to learn something from that senior staff member. But, um, again, just, just being able to have that environment where you could support each other, you know, make sure you don't have any generalized animosity. I love the fact that you said insight. You know, mm -hmm. what are you really mad about? Are you mad that Connie got the position? Or are you mad that you didn't get the position? Because that's two different arguments here. You know, if you're mad that I got the position, then tell me why and maybe I could fix it. But if you're mad that you didn't get the position, what can I do? Yeah. What can I do to fix that? I can't. So that's unfair. I think that, that that's unfair. So again, supporting growth means to, as hard as it may be, eliminate the jealousy. You know, as hard as it may be, eliminate the jealousy. And again, we're doing it for positions where everybody has that equal opportunity uh, mm -hmm. to move up. And again, I like what we said at the very beginning before we cut to a close. Also, if you're an agency, try to have a lot of opportunities because if you want to build an environment that trusts each other, you need to have a lot of opportunities. So when people go out for something, they know they don't have to wait for two years to get something else. Because if you have a, you know, don't forget, a lot of people are like, well, competitive environments are good. It teaches people to be the best. It also teaches people to have secrets from each other. Because if these positions are limited, then I'm not going to give out all my information because this person may have a chance of being better than me. So be careful. They're, competitive could be healthy, but up to a certain point, it starts to get to the fact that, hey, I'm not giving up everything because that person could mm -hmm. eventually get the position I want. Hey, Connie, anything you want to say in closing? Um, I just want to say, hey, listen, you know, as we are out in these facilities, you know, people have to feel comfortable to grow. We have to create an environment where people feel comfortable to grow, feel comfortable to be curious and ask questions 
and really to come to you um, as a leader and ask for your guidance. You know, there has to come a point where as we're trying to create that growth, that we are focusing on the people and we're focusing on the development of their skills. And as we develop their skills, we will start to see these natural leaders emerge. And so I would just say, please continue to cultivate those wonderful skills that we see coming out in our, our staff. Yeah, I think that was well. So I think it was a very good dialogue. Again, if you're looking to move up or if you're looking to support those that move up, I think we hit a lot of points here, uh, but there could be more. There always could be more. So please you know, feel free to comment uh, or um, if anything, email us to message us. So I think this is a topic I want to explore again because we definitely need it during these times. As always, guys, the show is tiered up. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe. Oh!